Edward, whenever you're ready, I think you can go ahead. All right, yeah, I think we're good to go. Seem to be getting a good attendance today. So thank you everyone for joining for us today. I am Edward Gardner. I'm a PhD student from University of Ottawa in the Dilworth Lab and a member of the CERC trainee committee. It's my pleasure today to introduce our excellent speakers. And just a quick reminder for the um, questions. We have a Q&A function on the bottom here and you can put your questions in for the speakers and I can relay the question to the speaker after their talks. So our first presenter today is Dr. Cynthia Hawkins. She obtained her MD PhD from Western University. She completed her residency training in neuropathology at the University of Toronto, including a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Zurich. Dr. Hawkins joined the hospital for sick children as a neuropathologist in 2002 and is the medical director of translational molecular pathology. She is a senior scientist at the Sick Kids Research Institute and a professor of laboratory medicine and pathobiology at the University of Toronto. Dr. Hawkins' clinical practice includes both surgical and autopsy pediatric neuropathology. She is best known for her expertise in pediatric brain tumors and has a research lab devoted to pediatric glioma. Her research interests include molecular pathogenesis and therapeutics for pediatric glioma and clinical implementation of novel diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic markers for pediatric brain tumors. The Hawkins Laboratory has contributed to the clinical, morphologic, and genetic characterization of diffuse intrinsic contact Pontine glioma and pediatric type glioma, as well as the clinical and biological implications of mutant histones. And with that, I'll leave the platform over to Dr. Cynthia Hawkins for her talk here. Okay, thank, thanks so much, Edward, and thanks so much to the group for giving Rob and I the opportunity to present some of our work and really looking forward to getting your feedback um, and suggestions. So I will share the screen here. Okay, so you should be able to see it. Edward, just confirm that it's showing what it's supposed to. Yeah, yeah, it's looking good here. Perfect, okay. Uh, so we're gonna tell you a little bit about some of the work we've done on oncogenic function of histones in pediatric high-grade glioma. Uh, so I'm gonna start just to give you a little bit of a background on what is uh, pediatric type high-grade glioma. Um, and then we'll give you some information about some of the background on histones as oncogenes. I'll talk about some of the diagnostic and prognostic implications of those histone mutations in clinical practice. And then Rob's going to spend really the bulk of the time going over some of the mechanistic insights uh, that we've found in terms of what are the role of that, those oncohistones in uh, brain cancer. So just to put this in, in some kind of a context, um, we've the classification of brain tumors has really been evolving. And the most recent update uh, with the WHO happened in 2021. And for those of us that do pediatric um, brain tumor research and, and pre clinical practice, one of the big advances, I think, in the newest version of the classification was really a, a, a clear recognition on the on the diagnostic side of a distinction between adult type uh, gliomas and pediatric type gliomas. So gliomas are a type of brain tumor that are at least morphologically resemble some of the glial cells in the brain. Uh, and, and usually when we're talking about these, we mean astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, uh, which are two of sort of the supportive cells um, in, the, in the human brain. Uh, and so the classification, if we go way back, started with looking really at morphology and has been increasingly incorporating more and more molecular information to try to make the diagnosis as, as uh, specific as possible, but also to help determine prognosis and what do we think are the best therapies. And so, you know, now if we look uh, at this classification on the adult side, uh, we're talking about IDH mutant gliomas generally or um, uh, glioblastomas, which are I IDH wild type. Uh, and then in the pediatric side, uh, that, that's where a lot of the histone mutations really come in. So for many years, we, we sort of knew that pediatric brain tumors didn't really behave the way adult brain tumors did, but uh, there wasn't really a lot of a genetic understanding of what was underpinning those, those differences. Um, we knew that in children, higher grade tumors or more malignant tumors were less common than low grade gliomas. 
we knew that they didn't usually progress. So it was, it happens, but it's not that common for in children for you to start out with a low grade tumor and for it to progress into a high grade tumor. Whereas in adults, that's pretty much the usual uh, course of things. Um, and, you know, as we started to do more and more molecular investigations, we could see that they were molecularly and biologically distinct from their adult type counterparts. And, you know, we started doing a lot of work characterizing uh, gliomas in particular many years ago, but really I think the big revolution came when uh, we started applying whole genome or, or whole exome sequencing uh, to these tumors. And so almost a decade ago, um, many of these studies came out and the uh, the finding that there were actually mute, mutant histones in these tumors um, it was made. And so this was first from Nada Jabato's group um, in McGill, uh, together with uh, the, the group in, in DKFZ in Heidelberg. And they found um, two mutations in H3.3 uh, that were fairly uh, common uh, in pediatric uh, gliomas. So since then, uh, as people have been doing more and more sequencing, we've uncovered more and more mutant histone genes across a spectrum of brain tumors, but also now uh, non-brain tumors. So um, most of these mutations end up affecting either the lysine 27 residue uh, or um, the glycine 34 or lysine 36 um, with the glycine 34 and brain tumors thought to influence um, the lysine 36. But it's now been found um, in addition to a, a number of brain tumors, also in uh, epithelial cancers like squamous cell carcinoma in the oral cavity, a number of different tumors arising in bone, uh, as well as you know more rarely, but also found in some hematopoietic neoplasms. And then, uh, you know, relatively recently, David Alice's group uh, did a broad look at, you know, how often are we actually finding histone mutations if we, if we really start to, to, uh, to look hard for them uh, in cancer in general. And in fact, you know, multiple histone genes can be mutated across many, many cancers. Most of these are actually subclonal. So it's, I think, really in the pediatric brain tumors and in some of the bone tumors where they're sort of clonal drivers of oncogenesis. Um, but certainly as sub subclonal oncogenic mechanism, I think many histone mutations can occur. And I think we're really at the very beginning of trying to understand how mutant histones can cause a cancer or contribute to cancer. So moving back to what we see in the pediatric type high-grade gliomas, we, uh, we see mutations largely in two of the histone genes. So uh, H33A, which as I'm sure this group knows, encodes the replication independent histone 3 variant 3.3. In that gene, we see mutations uh, in two different spots. So one where the lysine 27 is converted to a methionine, and the second where glycine 34 is uh, usually an arginine, occasionally a valine. Uh, then occasionally uh, hist, uh, an H3.1 uh, gene, usually it's H3C2 or HIST1H3B, although there have been reports of many of the other HIST1 genes also being mutated. These are almost always that the lysine 27, the, the glycine 34 mutation uh, virtually never occurs in 3.1. Um, some other sort of just interesting facts when we look at this. So there's really um, interesting spatial and temporal associations with these mutations. So the glycine 34 mutations are pretty much uh, exclusively in the hemispheres. There's a, there's a few, you know, case reports or whatever of these occurring elsewhere, but you know, the vast, vast majority are occurring in the hemispheres of the brain, whereas the lysine 27 mutations occur in the midline of the brain. Uh, and in fact, you know, they're so frequent in some types of uh, diffuse brain tumors, for example, in the pons, over 80% of these tumors will have a lysine 27 mutation. So, and, and as I mentioned, these are clonal, um, probably initiating uh, oncogenic events. So why there's this spatial difference, I think is still not really understood, but points toward there being uh, potentially different cells of origin or different uh, cells that are susceptible to these mutations. 
And then layered on top of that is some interesting age associations. So that's what this graph on the right is showing you. So the orange line is showing the age distribution of the lysine 27 mutation. Um, the gray line is showing you the age distribution of the glycine 34. And then I put in some other types of brain tumors just as, as reference. But the main point is that the lysine 27 mutations really peak during sort of mid-childhood in the 6 to 10-year-old um, age range. They can occur you know, any, any age. So, you know, even adults and even older adults can occasionally get these mutations, um, but they become much less common as a, as a source of, of oncogenesis, the older you get. Um, interestingly, the glycine 34 are more of an adolescent young adult. So they sort of peak in your twenties uh, and really tail off uh, in, in older age. So just a few details about these G34 mutant cases. Um, so as I mentioned, it's an adult, adolescent young adult disease, uh, much rarer than the K27M mutations. These uh, tumors or this mutation is highly associated with mutations in TP53 and ATRX. So well over 90% of the cases will have those as co-mutations. And then about 40% of them will also have mutations in PDGFR alpha. And sometimes that would, will occur at relapse uh, and is not, not always there at um, first presentation. Um, I put in this MGMT methylation information really, you know, if so if you're not a brain tumor person, it's not, not going to mean anything. Uh, but most of the uh, IDH mutant uh, tumors are MGMT methylated. Um, so as are these T34, this is thought to be uh, related to mechanisms of, of DNA repair and susceptibility to um, treatment with alkylating agents. So how are these treated? Uh, these are in the hemispheres, as I mentioned. So there is an attempt to get as much of a surgical resection as possible. And then the patients receive pretty much a standard chemotherapy radiation approach, uh, which is what we pretty much use for all high-grade gliomas. And so far, we're not really using targeted therapies or you know, really know exactly what to go after for these tumors, which is part of the focus of our work is to try to understand better how these oncogene or how these histone oncogenes are driving the cancer and what maybe do to better um, target them. So the survival for these is actually very, very poor. Um, showing you some survival curves there in the in the Kaplan Meyer. Um, the sort of orangey color um, is uh, the G34. So they and the K27Ms have a very poor outcome, uh, even compared to some of the other adult type gliomas. So the diffuse midline gliomas uh, with the K27 mutation, uh, again, as I mentioned, these are enriched in childhood, but can occur at any age. And this is particularly as you move outside the pond. So in the pontine region, most of patients are children, although again, occasionally you can get adolescents or young adults. As you move away from the pons into the thalamus or the spinal cord, so other midline locations, then older patients do become more common. These are pretty much treated with radiation, focal radiation, uh, which gives them a bit of a extended survival, but we're talking sort of a couple of extra months. Uh, the vast majority of these patients will be dead within one to two years of diagnosis. And there's sort of a lot of phase one trials looking at different therapeutic options for these patients, but, but no kind of um, home run so far. Just a few interesting things uh, with the 3.1 versus 3.3. Uh, I, you know, we, I don't think we really understand what the differences are between these two, although clearly there will be. So we know there's differences in location. As I mentioned, um, the 3.1s are um, pretty much always K27M. So the G34 doesn't occur in 3.1. The 3.1 mutations are pretty much restricted to the pawns. You very rarely will see them for, in the thalamus or the spinal cord. They tend to occur in younger children. So um, uh, there's an age association there as well. Their associated mutations are different. I've listed some of these over here. Uh, and they're thought to have a, a little bit of a better outcome uh, in terms of um, prognosis than patients with a 3.3 mutation. Um, as, as you know, they're incorporated in different spots. They're incorporated at different times, um, you know, it's cell cycle specific. And so you can imagine that, you know, they may have different functional effects as well. In terms of the survival, this was one of the early findings that we had once we identified this mutation and we went back and looked at all of our gliomas uh, from particular regions. So 
um, you know, if this, this is Pontine data, but if we look at our Pontine gliomas and we looked at the patients that had a histone mutation versus the patients that did not, we could see that the histone mutant group uh, was identifying really a very, very poor prognostic group and was more relevant in terms of us being able to tell that the patient was going to have a poor outcome than even which particular type of morphology or, or tumor they had um, under the microscope. And this is just another set of data where we looked at tumors that morphologically under the microscope didn't even look like high-grade gliomas, they looked like low-grade gliomas. And this purple line here is showing patients that had low-grade morphologically looking tumors, but had a histone mutation compared to other tumors with different mutations like in BRAF or NF1. And really we were uncovering a very aggressive and um, poor outcome subgroup of gliomas by identifying that histone mutation. And that actually led us back in 2016 to incorporate these histone mutant gliomas as a separate entity in the WHO classification and to give all of them a WHO grade of four. And in the most recent uh, 2021 classification that I showed you at the beginning, now uh, both the K27M mutant and the G34 mutant gliomas are specific diagnoses incorporated into the WHO. Um, so next we'll sort of move to Rob's uh, talk and he'll tell you what we've learned in terms of what these mutant histones are doing functionally. Thank you for your talk, Cynthia. That was very excellently done. And if there's any questions, you can put them into the uh, Q&A chat on the bottom. Uh, I have one quick question for you to start. So I noticed when you're looking for treating these cancers, you mentioned that you use radiotherapy. So I'm wondering if it's possible for using chemotherapy on these cancers or is the blood brain barrier sort of too much of a problem to overcome for these kinds of treatments, at least with what we have available for us now? Yeah, no, you can use chemotherapy. So for example, for the G34 mutant tumors, the standard would be temozolomide and radiation. Um, we don't use temozolomide in, in the midline gliomas, at least in the pontine ones, because there's been studies showing that it increases risk of hemorrhage and hemorrhage in the pons um, is bad. So, um, you know, and again, there's a slightly different approach because if you have a tumor up in your hemisphere, then you can at least try a surgical resection. Whereas if you have a tumor in these midline regions like the thalamus or the pons, you really can't do any surgery. So the most we do for those is a biopsy, try to understand what some of the genetics are. Um, and then focal radiation, they get quite a high dose radiation, 59 um, gray about. Uh, and um, there are a number of different chemotherapies that have been tried, including some targeted therapeutics. There's CAR T trials, immunotherapy, um, uh, as I mentioned, targeted agents. So for sure, the blood brain barrier is, is something to consider. And we do obviously try to choose agents that we think will cross the blood brain barrier, but there's even clinical trials. So one being initiated by one of our neurosurgeons at SickKids in collaboration with the group at Sunnybrook to use focused ultrasound to open the blood brain barrier and try to get the drugs across that might we think might work, but um, but but weren't getting across before. Um, there's also confection enhanced delivery approaches where you literally put a little tube into the ponds and try to kind of micro inject the drug. Um, so again, a lot of different approaches. We just haven't so far moved the bar very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, got a hi, Cynthia from Jira Manuel. So I think that there's no more questions here. We can move on to Robert's talk. So Dr. Robert Sidaway received his um, PhD from the University of Oxford, where he studied the regulation of transcription and melanoma by post-translational modifications. He joined the lab of Dr. Cynthia Hawkins at SickKids in Toronto for his postdoctoral work. He focused on high-grade glioma, in particular activation of oncogenic pathways mediated by alternative splicing of cancer driver genes, and the molecular mechanisms by which oncogenic histones promote tumor genesis. He currently leads transitional research projects at SIPKIDS, aiming to better match patients with targeted therapies. And with that, I can leave the floor for Robert. And again, any questions can be put into the Q&A and we can get to those questions after the talk here. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, as Cynthia mentioned, um, the, a, a large focus of our lab is on the role and um, function of these uh, oncohistone mutations. Um, so, 
as she as she outlined, there's there's two uh, two amino acids that that uh, that get mutated. Uh, so there's H3 lysine 27 gets substituted for methionine, and uh, glycine 34 specifically in H3.3 uh, gets substituted for um, arginine as well as uh, valine and to a lesser extent tryptophan. So at a molecular level, uh, what do these um, uh, mutations do? Um, so early work on K27M showed that there was a dominant uh, genome-wide loss of HDK27 trimethylation um, with some local gains. But broadly speaking, across the genome, the effect is, uh, is, is a global uh, loss of um, uh, K27 trimethylation. Um, which is in a, accompanied by a gain of uh, HDK36 uh, methylation. Um, this is a, a result of um, a, a, some, some kind of dominant negative effect on PRC2. The, the full mechanism of this still isn't fully um, understood, I don't think. Um, and as well as this, we find also with K27M mutant cells that there's a gain of HDK27 acetylation on enhancer regions as well as um, a, a genome-wide DNA, DNA hypermethylation uh, phenotype. In terms of G34R, um, so there are local losses in HDK36 trimethylation through inhibition of SETD2, um, but not the dominant um, genome-wide effects that uh, we see with K27M. Um, and then there's local gains to match the, uh, the K36 effects, um, with uh, with a, uh, a local gain of K27 trimethylation. And so really what we wanted to, to know was what other uh, kind of chromatin pathways or, or other pathways uh, could be affected as a result of these uh, mutations. Um, and what are, what are some of the proteins that the, that the mutant histones are interacting with um, as, a, as a potential um, thought towards moving towards a, a a therapeutic targeting of these, these mutations. So to do this, we chose to uh, use a bio-ID approach. Um, so traditionally, people would study post-protein-protein uh, uh, protein interactions with um, affinity purification and mass spectrometry. Um, the problem with APMS is that it needs strong methods to extract um, proteins in locations like chromatin, um, such as high salt or detergent. Um, and this can disrupt protein complexes which obviously reduces the, the, the amount of usable information that you get out of your experiment. So the, the benefit of BioID is that you biotinylate proteins of interest in real time, which allows for um, high, harsh lysis in your experiment. So the way it works is you, you fuse a biotin ligase to your protein of interest, uh, introduce it into cells, and if you grow them in the presence of biotin, then interacting proteins um, will be uh, biotinylated on free amine groups, where while well, non-interacting proteins, uh, they, they don't. Um, this allows for very harsh lysis, followed by uh, capture on, on streptavidin, um, and then you can, you can identify your, um, your, your interacting proteins as, as you would usually. So for this experiment, we, uh, we, we did bioID experiments on wild-type uh, histone H3.1 and H3.3, as well as the H3.1 K27M, H3.3 K27M, and H3.3 G34R uh, mutations. So overall in, ex in our experiment, we found uh, around 900 uh, high confidence proteins uh, to be interacting with, with one or more of, the, of, of these histones, of which 412 showed a, a differential binding with at least one uh, compared to a wild type counterpart. And overall, from the clustering, uh, what we can see is that compared to uh, wild type H3 on the on the left, the three mutants are more similar to each other um, than, than they are to the wild types. And overall, G34R tends to lose interactions um, with, with, uh, with, with interactors, while K27M uh, tends more towards uh, gains of, of interaction. We look next at the um, at the pathways that are being affected by, uh, by uh, these, these differentially bound proteins, and a number of things uh, jumped out to us. So firstly, the K27M and G34R uh, mutations, they both lose interaction with uh, chromatin uh, modifiers, as well as DNA repair proteins. Uh, G34R um, has, a, has a gain in metabolic uh, interaction uh, with, with, with 
um, met metabolic proteins um, and loses interaction with DNA methyltransferases. Um, and the K27Ms, uh, they uh, seem to gain interaction with transcription uh, related uh, proteins, and this is lost with, uh, with G34R. And so overall, this distills down into five kind of key affected areas um, that, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to outline uh, in, the, in the rest of the talk. So first, uh, the quest first question we had was, uh, does G34R play a role in metabolism? Um, so when we looked a little bit more closely at these gained metabolic proteins, uh, we realized very quickly that these are proteins that localize to the mitochondria. So if we look at uh, proteins that are lost on the left or gained on the right, um, for all three mutants, there's, uh, there's a, a, a pattern of loss and gain in, uh, in nuclear compartments. But in the G34R proteins, we see that the gains are dominantly um, coming, coming from uh, mitochondrial uh, compartments. Um, and when we look at the, um, at, at the data in a slightly more granular way, uh, we found that actually uh, proteins encoding the, both the inner and the outer mitochondrial uh, membrane transporters the, from the, the, the Tom and Tim complex, they have a gained association with G34R uh, compared to uh, K27M or H2 wild type. So this suggested to us that maybe there was a, um, a, a relocalization of some of the G34R to the, the mitochondria. Um, so to ask, uh, in a little bit more detail about this question, um, we decided to uh, uh, co-stain uh, normal human astrocytes expressing epitope tagged uh, G34R, um, and we stained them with uh, HA to detect the um, to detect the histone, and mitotracker red to detect uh, the, the, the the mitochondria. And what we found was that although, as we would expect, the vast majority of the histone was uh, localized to the nucleus, if we uh, take really high magnification images, uh, we can find uh, focal accumulation of G34R um, outside the nucleus and in regions that co-localize co with, uh, with mitochondria. Um, and if we compare the, um, the number of these foci per cell, um, with as well as the, 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 a similar experiment in the primary mutant uh, line uh, with the number of uh, mitochondrial localizations in uh, wild type H3 expressing NHAs, we find that there's a small but significant increase in uh, mitochondrial localization of the uh, G34R protein. Another suggestion that there was maybe a functional role of uh, G34R in the, in the mitochondria um, was from uh, binding to TFAM. So TFAM is a core component of the uh, mitochondrial nucleoid and mitochondrial transcription factor. And we found in the BioID data that uh, it does, it, the only protein that it interacted with was, uh, was G34R. Um, and if we do uh, commune precipitation assays um, in, in NHA cells expressing either wild type K27M or G34R, uh, we find that specifically TFAM is interacting with the, with the G34R protein. So TFAM is known to regulate mitochondrial copy number and it coats the mitochondrial DNA to aid its compaction and activates mitochondrial promoters. Um, and this suggested to us that perhaps uh, this mitochondrially localized G34R uh, could be influencing uh, mitochondrial metabolism. So to investigate this a little bit further, um, whether, whether maybe there were uh, metabolic differences in G34R mutant cells, uh, we use mass spec to generate metabolomic profiles of NHAs expressing either um, H2 wild type or G34R. And we find that globally, there's a, there's a clear separation in uh, metabolic status of the G34R and the, and the wild type cells. And in particular, the G34R uh, cells, they have uh, increased uh, metabolites from the TCA cycle, uh, shown here in the, in, in the heat map on the right, as well as uh, amino acid uh, metabolism. So overall, it, and from, from this part, we can see that the, um, the, the, the relocalization of a fraction of the G34R is at, at least associated with, um, with, with altered mitochondrial metabolism. The second uh, kind of 
key thing that popped out from the from our bio ID data um, was a potential um, alteration of DNA damage repair, particularly with G34R. So DNA damage repair proteins were um, were affected with both the K27M and the G34R mutants, um, but it seemed more more associated with a loss in the in the G34R. And when we started looking at, in more detail at what these proteins were, we found that a number of DNA repair pathways had a loss of um, a loss of interaction with, uh, with 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 the G34 mutant. So, in particular, homologous recombination proteins tended to be lost uh, with with G34, as well as uh, some some proteins from the mismatch in nucleotide excision repair pathways. And set against this, we found that there was a trend towards a gained interaction with um, non-homologous end joining. Uh, proteins with the with the G34. So it seems like we have a loss of homologous recombination and a gain of uh, non-homologous enzyme. And this was we found this was quite interesting uh, conceptually. So histone H3 is known to have a role in uh, double D DNA double strand break pair uh, pathway choice. Um, so methylation of HCK36 is um, is important for both um, uh, non-homologous end joining and for um, homologous recombination. So K36 dimethyl is important for recruitment of uh, Q70-Q80 uh, for the non-homologous end joining pathway. And uh, K36 trimethylation is important for recruitment of uh, ledge F and downstream homologous recombination proteins. So to look into this a little bit further, um, we used uh, proximity ligation assays um, to ask uh, some questions about the um, about the, the interaction with G34R and these uh, some of these repair factors, um, and we found that uh, G34R has a decreased interaction compared to H3 wild type with uh, with ledge F. Um, and that the increase in association that you would see post radiation with uh, with wild type H3, we don't see with G34R. And looking downstream, uh, from here we see uh, at, at, at times post radiation, uh, we see a failure to recruit Rad51 to um, uh, H3G34R, whereas we do see a uh, an increased interaction with uh, with H3.3 wild type. So set, set against this, um, we see uh, um, an increased interaction post-radiation with uh, 53BP1, uh, which is important for the non-homologous end joining pathway with H3.3G34R. Uh, um, and this is suggestive that there's a, there's a switch from uh, homologous recombination to non-homologous end joining um, in, these, in these mutant tumors. Now, non-homologous end joining is, uh, is more error prone than homologous recombination. Um, and so the next question that we asked was, does this have a, is there, is there a functional effect on this? And so to answer this question, we looked at uh, whole genome sequencing of either uh, G34R mutant tumors um, or as a, uh, as a, a control set IDH mutant uh, uh, GBMs. Um, and we found that there is a, that there's a considerable increase in the uh, TMB, uh, so the, the number of mutations per megabase in the G34 mutant tumors. So this loss of uh, uh, interaction with, or re redistribution, sorry, of interaction with DNA uh, repair proteins with G34R is associated with a, with a higher mutation burden in, in these tumors. Um, the third kind of key theme that came out of our, uh, our BioD data was a potential effect on DNA methylation. And this was a little bit surprising to us because we found in the, um, in the, in the first instance that um, in, uh, when, when these mutations were first being characterized, um, that the K27M mutations have a global loss of DNA methylation. And so what we were expecting to find uh, was that there would be a... Um, uh, a, a loss of interaction with DNA methyltransferases uh, with the K27M, um, and we didn't really know what to expect with, uh, with G34R. But with K27M, what we found is that, the, that there is no significant difference in interaction with the, um, with the DNA methyltransferases that we captured here. Um, so we, we found DNAMT1 and 3A. We didn't, didn't detect uh, DNAMT3B in the, in, in the bioID assay. Um, 
but surprisingly, we found that there was a, a strong loss of interaction between H3.3 G34R um, and both of these uh, DNA methyl transferases. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to look at here was, um, well, does is, is, is this true? Um, so we used a, a, a proximity ligation assay um, to, to, to follow up on this. Um, so every, every interaction um, between G34 or H3.3 wild type, and uh, in this case, uh, DNMT1, uh, is represented as a, as, as a single focus in the, in, in the microscope. So by, by quantifying the number of foci um, per, per, per nucleus, we can, we can answer questions about the prevalence of this interaction um, in, in cells. And what we found with the PLA assays is that the, there is a strong, indeed a strong reduction in, uh, in interaction between the G34R and DNMT1 compared to the interaction between the issue from through wild type and, uh, and DNMT1. Um, to look into this in more detail, uh, we turn to a large panel of uh, uh, DNA methylation assays um, that, have, that have previously been published. Um, and these were categorized into, into different groups. So we had uh, wild type tumors, uh, tumors with a K27M mutation, a G34R mutation, or IDH mutant uh, uh, GBMs as a, as a control. Um, so IDH mutant tumors are known to have a global hypermethylation. And so we were, we, it, it was good to see that we could see, we could indeed see this, um, that this increase. The K27M uh, mutant tumors compared to wild type tumors, they do have a drop in, uh, in global methylation. So this plot on the left is showing the, uh, the median uh, methylation level per, uh, per, per sample that we had. Um, but strikingly, the G34R mutant tumors, they have the strongest drop of all. And this is reflected too, if we look at, um, at individual probes, um, so this now is going sample uh, across samples and looking at the, the median methylation state of, um, of each probe in the array. Um, we see the same uh, increase in, uh, in methylation in IDH mutant uh, tumors, a drop in K27M and a stronger drop in, uh, in G34R. So the, the, this, uh, this loss of interaction between G34R and DNA methyl transferases is really driving a loss of, uh, of DNA methylation across the genome in these, uh, in these mutant tumors. The fourth area that we, uh, that we, we, we picked out as being, being potentially uh, important in our, in our BioD data set was transcriptional regulation. Um, and here, interestingly, we found that there was, a, there was an opposite effect uh, between K27M and G34R. So we found that K27M primarily gains uh, transcription factors and G34R primarily loses uh, interaction with transcription factors. So this gain of transcription factor association with K27M, um, both H2.1 and H2.3, is consistent with a genome-wide loss of uh, H2K27 trimethylation which is going to, as one of its effects, lead, lead to uh, large genomic regions that are now uh, uh, de-repressed and are more permissive for uh, access by, by transcription factors and downstream transcriptional remodeling. So the, with the G34R, if you remember from the beginning, um, what we see is a, is, is a local loss in K36 trimethylation um, in genes where H2.3 G34R is incorporated and so this wouldn't necessarily be expected to lead to an increase in, um, in accessibility to transcription factors, um, which is in agreement with, uh, with both our, our data and uh, previously published findings showing that G34R on its own has a relatively modest effect on the, um, on the transcriptome. And when we started to think about this a little bit more, um, what it seems as though the, the K36 uh, trimethyl loss is perhaps doing is limiting access by, by other proteins that we're seeing, such as H, HDAX, uh, DNA methyl transferases, and DNA repair factors. So looking at the, um, uh, the, the set of chromatin modifiers that we find to be uh, that we found interacting with uh, one or other of the of, of the histones in our experiment, it was quite striking that overall G34R is losing interaction to quite a lot of chromatin proteins, 
um, including lysine demethylases, HDACs, as well as the, the, the DNA methyltransferases. And thinking about this a little bit more, um, we started to wonder whether perhaps um, rather than a, a, an, an obvious effect at the um, sort of overall gene expression level, um, maybe G34 is having, having a, a disruptive influence on transcription via cri uh, cryptic transcription. So cryptic transcription has, was uh, originally characterized in yeasts, um, and it's previously been reported in cancer um, uh, cells more, more recently, as well as in uh, aging human cells, um, where it may serve to increase uh, tumor cell immunogenicity. Um, and the, the way cryptic transcription works is that in the wave, wake of uh, DNA pol 2 passage, um, the combined action of um, histone demethylases, HDACs, DNA methyltransferases, DNMTs and uh, SETD2, which trimethylates H2K36, um, reestablishes the, the local uh, repressive chromatin environment through the gene body, um, which is going to prevent uh, spurious in, uh, uh, initiation of transcription from uh, start sites sitting in the, in the middle of the gene. But if you lose access uh, or uh, association of, of these proteins with, uh, with the gene body, um, perhaps such as we, we would see locally downstream from uh, G34R uh, with this local loss of K36 trimethyl. Uh, we don't have uh, so much of this, uh, this repressive chromatin uh, sitting in the gene body. And now POL2, as it passes, is able to initiate um, these, uh, these cryptic transcripts uh, from sites within the, uh, the body of the gene. Um, so to, to, to look at this, we took uh, RNA-seq data from human fetal neural stem cells that were uh, expressing uh, 3.3 G34 or wild type. Um, and the effect of cryptic, cryptic initiation of transcription with a gene um, increases the, the, the coverage in downstream exons relative to, uh, to earlier exons. Um, and so what we did was look at the exon level of expression in multi-exon genes in these, uh, in these cells and looked at the, uh, the, the expression um, in, in later exons relative to either the first or the second exon. And what we found was that there is, as, as you go through the gene, there is a, um, a, there is a steady and significant increase um, in, the, in this uh, exon uh, ratio of, of compared to the first exon, which would be consistent with uh, an increase in cryptic transcription uh, downstream from the uh, H2.3G34R uh, incorporation. The last um, area that, that we uh, highlighted as being potentially important with the, from the, our data set um, is perhaps the one that would be the most uh, obvious one to start looking at, and this is uh, chromatin modifiers. So one thing that really leapt out to us um, when, we, when we started looking at the enzymes that were, were directly affected by, uh, by all three of these mutations is that both K27M and G34R have altered interaction with H2K9 uh, modifiers. So H3K27M um, we found has uh, lost interaction with uh, H3K9 methylases, while the G34R mutant it loses interaction with the methylases and with the um, and with the demethylases. So H3K9 um, trimethylation, as I don't really think needs uh, much introduction here, um, but it's important for transcriptional silencing and heterochromatin uh, formation. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's disruption um, in these oncohistomutant tumor lines um, could have an have a, uh, important downstream consequence. So to look into this further, uh, what we wanted to do was to ask, well, so we, we have um, altered, uh, altered interaction with, uh, with the, the, these methylases, and in the case of G3 demethylases, uh, we focused on the methylases uh, for the for the rest of our project, um, and the question we asked first was, well, do they have uh, an effect on the um, methyltransferase activity? So we, with uh, Eric Campos's lab, um, did uh, some uh, in vitro methylation assays using nucleosomes that are reconstituted with either wild type or uh, mutant H2.3. And if we titrate in increasing amounts of either SUF39H2, which is a um, HD kinase trimethylase, 
or AHMT2, which is dimethylase, uh, we find that there's a, with, as, as you would expect, with all of the mutants and, and both enzymes, we see a dose-dependent increase in, uh, in methylation on the, on the histone. Um, but the, when, when we look at the at quantifications of these, uh, we find, so relative to H3.3 wild type in blue, that K27M has a, has a decrease in, uh, in uh, uh, activity um, from, from, from these, these methylases. Uh, but the G34R has a um, has a actually has an increased activity despite its uh, reduced association in the bioID. And I'm not not going to show the data here. Um, but if we purify nucleosomes from uh, either wild type or mutant cells, uh, we see we see much the same thing. So there there is a decrease in uh, H3K9 trimethylation on K27M mutant uh, 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 histones, as well as their uh, wild-time nucleosomal partners, um, and a, a local increase in H2K9 trimethylation um, in conjunction with, uh, with the G34R. And so really what this, this seems to us is that, the, is that this altered balance um, between the methylases and the demethylases with the G34R uh, seems to come out in favor of, of, of a slight increase in methylation. Um, whereas with the, the K27M, uh, we, have, we have this drop. Um, so the, the last thing that we really wanted to look at here um, in this, uh, this experiment is, can, is this something that we can go after? So the, these mutant, uh, mutant histones in and of themselves, they're, 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 they present a, uh, an interesting target, but directly going after them, uh, the histones themselves therapeutically is going to be very difficult. Whereas if we could go after um, uh, an enzyme that modifies them, then this, this suddenly becomes more, uh, more tractable. So as a, as a jumping off point for, for this, uh, this, this part of, of the work, we took a uh, uh, patient-derived uh, high-grade uh, glioma cell lines that read the K27M mutant or G34R mutant, um, and transduce them with shRNAs that were targeting um, one of the um, H2K9 methylases that we found uh, to be having, having altered interaction um, in, our, in a bioID experiment. Um, and what we found is that compared to uh, control, um, all of the overall, all of the shRNAs that we, that we used are, are reducing the viability of, the, of the, these mutant glioma lines. Uh, compared to um, uh, the, the controls for both the K27M and the, and the G34R. Um, to go uh, one step further, uh, we, we wanted to um, test, test more molecules of this. Um, so we used, in the first instance, uh, a specific inhibitor of SUV39H2, which is an H2K9 trimethylase. Um, and we used this OTS18, 186935 uh, compound, which is specific to uh, SUV39H1. It doesn't really inhibit SUV39H, uh, so specific to SUV39H2. It doesn't really inhibit uh, SUV39H1. And we treated a panel of, uh, of cell lines with, uh, with increasing doses of, of this compound. And in red are the, the oncohistone mutant uh, high grade glioma lines, both K27M and G34R. Uh, blue is uh, H3 wild type lines. Gray, the gray line is uh, normal cells. So in this case, we used astrocytes and uh, OPCs. Um, and in black, uh, we have uh, we have HeLa cells. So compared to all these other control lines, uh, we found that the the, the oncohistone mutant high grade glioma lines um, are are highly sensitive to uh, inhibition with SUV39H2. Um, which is in keeping with the shRNA findings that we that we found, um, and we found similar effects with uh, as as well with ketosin, which is a a, a more uh, the more more sensitive uh, inhibitor in terms of uh, reducing reducing viability at lower concentrations. And we think this is because it not only in, inhibits uh, C39H2, but it also targets C39H1 and to a lesser extent the uh, the K9 dimethylases. Um, so it's more of a, I guess, a, a complete inhibitor of HCK9 uh, methylation. And so 
what we what we found from this part is that although in in onset the, the these two oncohistones have very different initial effects so k27m its initial effects is on k27 and has a, a consequential effect on k36 um and g34r has a has an opposing effect so rather than a gain of k36 g34r uh, has a local loss of k36 with a, a local gain of K27 to, um, in, in contrast to K27M's uh, global loss of uh, K27 trimethylation. Um, but despite this, both of these uh, mutant histones seem to require uh, K9 methylation um, for their ongoing uh, tumor cell survival. And so this is, this is something that we, 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 we think is a, a potentially a, a therapeutic vulnerability in these uh, mutant glioma lines. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and to summarize what, uh, what we've uh, shown you today. Uh, so we found that oncohistone mutations widely disrupt the histone interactome uh, with effects beyond chromatin. Um, HCK27M, um, we found, really had, a, had an increased uh, association with transcription factors, which is consistent with its uh, genome-wide effects on um, HCK27 trimethylation. HCG34R, um, in contrast, has decreased association with transcription factors alongside increased transcription, um, as well as mitochondrial metabolism and uh, DNA repair defects. And finally, um, HGK27M and HGG34R mutant uh, tumor cell lines are vulnerable to loss of uh, HGK9 uh, methyl transferase activity. Um, which may serve as a, a therapeutic vulnerability um, it, it, that, that we can exploit in these, uh, these deadly tumors. So with that, I'll thank you. Um, and just to thank the, the people in the lab who've helped with, uh, with, with our work, as well as our collaborators at SickKids, Eric and Mike, um, and at UHN, uh, Brian, um, as well as the, the broader uh, clinical community um, at SickKids. And thank you to our generous funders for supporting our work. Thanks for that, Robert. That was an excellent talk there. And we got a decent number of questions coming in here. So I can start with these. So first one we got from Alan Underhill. Does the increased association of the G334 mutant with 53BP1 come with changes in H4K20ME2? Uh, sorry, you're muted again. There. Yeah. Um, that's a, a really good question. Um, we we don't know. Um, we're, we're looking at the moment at the broader um, the broader effects on on chromatin modification with and specifically in association with the with with the DNA damage. All right, thanks for that. So we've got a question from Nicholas Dejay. Can the increased mutational burden seen in H3.3G34R tumors be attributed to the mutation histone rather than TP53 slash ATRX? Um, so again, that's a that that's a good question. Um, the the sample size that we have is relatively small, um, and so it's it's a little bit difficult to say for for sure one way or the other. I'm not sure. Cynthia, yeah, I can, you have more. Maybe I'll yeah. Maybe I'll jump in for that one. So. We actually specifically chose IDH mutant uh, gliomas as a sort of the control group for that because uh, IDH mutant astrocytomas are also highly associated with TP53 and ATRX. So, that, you know, as much as we could control in a patient cohort of tumors for the effects of TP53 and ATRX, uh, the, the increased mutation in G34 does not seem to be directly related to that. Uh, you know, again, that you can have an IDH mutant with TB53 and ATRX, which overall has a lower mutational burden than the G34 with TB53 and ATRX. We are trying an experiment now in sort of a more isogenic context uh, to see if we can if we can actually demonstrate over time uh, the glioma or glial cells acquiring mutations just by introduction of the G34 itself. Great, thank you. So I think we got the next question from Ying Ying Liang. Thanks for the interesting talk. Don't know whether I missed the point, and I wonder if you have looked at the potential relation of overall methylation level with radiosensitivity of each subtype of gliomas. Uh, that's a great question, and no, uh, to, to my knowledge, nobody has nobody's looked at that. 
Um, do you, so I, I guess, the, do you mean DNA methylation? or histone methylation yeah, or there's a lot of different methylations of, yeah so we do know that mgmt methylation is associated with with sensitivity to alkylating agents but not specifically to radiation all right so for the next question this is going to be from uh michael johnson does G34R exhibit impaired nuclear import, or is the nuclear cytoplasmic distribution as expected? Yeah, so that, that was something that we, we spent quite a long time thinking about too. And the answer is it doesn't seem to affect nuclear import. Um, so if we look in the, I mean, if in the um, IF experiment that, that I showed, uh, you could clearly see that the, the vast majority of the histone would be, would be nuclear as you would expect. Um, if we fractionate cells, uh, we find uh, we find much the same thing. So, the bulk of the of the G thirty four R does st still seem to be being chromatinized, um, as as you would expect. Um, it's just that there's a there's a fraction um, of the of the mutant that that, that seems to be going to uh, the mitochondria. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so. We got one question from Andrew Volk here. Did you find differential location of the CAF1 complex to the oncogenic H3.3 histones in this model? And he says it's a follow-up on the MCP paper. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so just, just to give a little bit of context to that, uh, that question for everybody, um, we, as well as looking at the, at the mutant histones, we also uh, looked at the, uh, the uh, interactomes of the, of the wild-type histones because we had the data there as well. Um, and what we found there was that the, and so as everybody knows, H2.3 is replication independent, is deposited into active chromatin um, by HERA or repressive chromatin by ATRX DAX, um, while H2.1 from uh, uh, nuclear extracts followed by uh, APMS is, um, is specifically deposited by, by CAF1. Um, so what we found uh, in the in this MCP paper is that actually with HERA and DAX and ATRX we find the expected H uh, two point three specificity, um, but with H two point one, um, or sorry, with with CAF one we find that actually in in living cells with with BioID and other follow up experiments it actually doesn't discriminate between H two point one and H two point three. So CAF one is able to interact with and uh, deposit H two point three throughout the cell cycle. Um, and so to, to now to directly um, answer the question, um, we did. Uh, there were there were some variations in uh, in binding to uh, to CAF one um, with the with with the mutants. Um, the the effect, if I remember right, was bigger with the G thirty four R than with the K twenty seven M in terms of what we what we saw with the with the bio ID. Um, but it was it 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 wasn't the entire complex the way the way we saw the effect with the um, with with between the wild type histones. So it it could be it could be a complex independent um, independent phenomenon, but we we're not really sure. Thank you. So the next question we got is from Anna Nikolic. Interesting talk. Do you see a change in the localization of the H three G thirty four R mark chromatin in the nucleus and redistribution with respect to the uh, lamina associated domains? Um, that that's a great idea. Um, we we haven't looked at that, um, but it it certainly certainly would be it would be interesting to look at that uh, both for the the K twenty seven M as well as the as as the G thirty four R. Um, but in, in terms of in terms of our data, we we don't really have a um, an idea particularly about um, redistribution with uh, with lads or um, the the broader uh, chromatin architecture. Okay, I lost my track here. Okay, here we go. So we got a question from Panagiotis Prinos. Have you looked if there are any nuclear morphology abnormalities in the H3K27M or the um, G34R mutants? Um, we haven't. Um, I think there is some data out there um, suggesting that there that there is um, some some sort of uh, defect here. 
Um, I believe it's more G34 associated than, than K27M. Thanks again. We got a follow up from Andrew Volk. So, his follow up is what members of the um, CAF1 complex are enriched on the G34R H3.3? Uh, so, we see um, enrichment um, of it's CAF1A, um, so P P150. Great, right, great, thank you. Um, so we got a question from Felix Tan that was asked a little while ago, but I'm just seeing now got kind of lost there. Um, can the DNA mutations on histones or the epigenetic methylation slash acetylation markers be used for diagnosis and particularly for early cancer diagnosis? Uh, yes, they, they, they can and they are. Um, so we, we we test directly for um, for the histone mutations. We can pick them up with uh, immunohistochemistry, next generation sequencing uh, that we that we use clinically, or um, other other assays like uh, DDPCR, for example. Um, so yes, the the histone mutations themselves are are diagnostic and in and of themselves are enough to to diagnose the tumor. Um, we can also clinically look at HDK27 trimethylation um, in, in, in immune histochemistry with, uh, with, with these, these tumors. Great. Thank you for that. And we got one last question here, and this is from John Pulikin. Oh, there's another question, so maybe do more. So is there any change in chromatin architecture with the um, H3K27M mutation? Um, so we we haven't looked at this really. Um, the we don't we don't have uh, you know, the the, the high C type data sets in, in in the lab at the moment that we would need to to, to look at those questions. But it's a great uh, it's a great suggestion. All right, so we do got one question here from Karen Atkin. Changes in associations with methylation and DNMTs were seen, but there were also changes. Sorry, I kind of misread the question. Changes in association with methylation and DN DNMTs were seen, but were there also changes in hydroxymethylation and tests? We didn't see anything that would suggest suggest that in the in the data set. But it, 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 since we were just looking from a from a histone interaction point of view with the with the mutants, if there was a I guess a, a secondary effect from arising from one of these mutations, uh, then then we we wouldn't have picked it up from that. Great, thank you. And uh, another follow up from a Philly Tan. So, going back to the diagnosis, is it possible that there might be a way to do that via blood testing for these patients? Yes. Yeah. Um, in, yeah, in principle. Um, so, tumor cells do shed. Uh, they'll they'll shed uh, uh, DNA um, from them. So, circulating tumor DNA is certainly something that people are uh, uh, actively working on to to. Be able to to use diagnostically, um, and yeah, this is this is something that we're that we're working on the lab. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to add anything else here? Yeah, sure. So, um, there are people, not us, uh, but um, you know, Daniel De Carvalho would be a good example of people looking for methylation signatures in the blood that might suggest there's a cancer there. So far. I don't believe that that would actually be able to tell you exactly which kind of cancer, and it wouldn't be able to tell you obviously specific mutations because it's looking at global DNA methylation patterns that are sort of altered in blood. There's other applications, sort of liquid biopsy, which, it, which is what Rob was referring to, where you're looking for actual DNA mutations in fluids. For brain, um, you can use blood, but the sensitivity is very low for brain tumors. So most of the studies are focusing on CSF as a source of liquid biopsy material for finding the mutation. So uh, we, we can uh, find the H3K27M mutation in CSF from patients that do have these diffuse midline gliomas. And that will probably be a clinical test. In terms of a screening test, which is I think sort of what you were getting at, um, theoretically, but I think not a great screening, not a great cancer for screening, right? So generally you want to have a little bit higher, uh, prevalence cancers to do sort of a national screening program because it ends up being really expensive to find a very few number of cases. So more likely the application would be 
you find a lesion on MRI, but you don't know exactly what kind of cancer it is. So you do a CSF test to see if you can find the mutations and, and make a specific diagnosis. And then you could follow those patients over time in terms of their response to therapy um, and early relapse uh, by, by looking for those markers in CSF. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this will be all the time we have there. And sorry for any questions we might not have gotten to at the end. So thank you for everyone joining us today and all these excellent questions we asked for the speakers and special thanks to Dr. Sidaway and Dr. Hawkins. You both gave very excellent talks and it's very interesting to see where your work will be going and what the results will be. So thanks for joining us today and thank you everyone else. <laughs>